I did a lot of different kinds of field work uh, under some of the grad students at ESF. So I had the opportunity to work on a, a Pet Cody diet assessment project. I worked in a, uh, a laboratory on the fourth floor of Illicol and ESF, uh, sorting through coyote excrement, um, trying to figure out what they were eating. And uh, that was more of a fun job than it sounds. Um, I also had the opportunity to work with another grad student, alum of FLCC as well, um, on her project uh, surveying river otter in the Finger Lakes. So we canoed a lot of the Finger Lakes region looking for river otter latrine sites. And one of the sites that we uh, studied was actually the Mueller Field Station. So most of my professional background is actually in uh, zookeeping and zoology. Uh, I spent some time working at the Utica Zoo as a swing keeper. So I worked with over 240 different species of animals, anything from large carnivores to small mammals, birds, reptiles, lots of different stuff. Um, currently, I am a uh, education outreach person at, uh, at Mueller Field Station, and I'm also uh, an adjunct instructor at FLCC. Uh, I teach two courses for the conservation department currently. Um, I also, in my free time, am the director of Wolf Mountain Nature Center, which is in Smyrna, New York. Uh, we have 14 wolves, three coyotes, and five Arctic fox there. Um, so if you've never heard of us, please Google us, Facebook us, check us out, come visit this spring. And then additionally in my free time, I'm hoping to one day open my own little wildlife center up in uh, Farmington, Palmyra area. All right. Thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Chelsea Gendro. I am the other conservation outreach educator for FLCC's Mueller Field Station and also an FLCC alumni. When I finished um, with my environmental studies degree at FLCC, I went on to pursue a bachelor's degree in wildlife management from SUNY Cobleskill. And then following that, I obtained a master's degree in sustainable natural resource management. And in between all of those things, I've done a lot of different types of various field work, um, working mostly with waterfowl. I did a, um, a couple studies that were under um, other graduate students that were working on like either their master's degree or their PhD, collecting research on either nesting or migrating waterfowl. So those were some of my favorite projects that I worked on. I've also worked with um, trout doing, doing a trout restoration project out west. Um, I've done vegetation surveys. So um, a really well-rounded background as far as um, getting a little bit of everything. Um, and all of my favorite activities and hobbies uh, kind of also surround being outside. I, I really love hiking. Um, I like gardening. I've got a ton of house plants, kayaking, birding, camping, fishing, learning new plants. So I just really love to be outside and I'm always amazed at what I can keep learning and discovering and finding. Um, and for a year now, I've um, acquired an adventure buddy who is at the bottom of the slide. Her name is Fern. She's my puppy and um, she loves being in the woods as well. She's really cute. <laughs> Okay, so just a little bit of background information on a Mueller field station. So, like I mentioned, we are part of Finger Lakes Community College. Um, Florence Mueller, she was the original owner of this land along with Amo Mueller. Uh, they donated, well, Florence donated this back in 2000, 40 acres, uh, 48 acres of land. Um, so, we are in an incredible spot. We're about a mile south of Honeyway Lake. We have a lot of biological diversity here. We're adjacent to an 837 acre freshwater wetland. It's a silver maple ash swamp. Um, it is a class one wetland, which means most valuable. Uh, that's a cl classification by the Department of Environmental Conservation. Down here at the field station, we have different conservation courses that are offered. So Students get to take wetland mammals down here, a fisheries techniques course, terrestrial and 
aquatic ecology lab, um, winter ecology from time to time. We have a pretty well established K through 12 program, and that's what we're all involved in. And there's also a community outreach, which we're continuing to grow. We do have a walleye fish hatchery down here, and that is in partnership with the DEC. Um, it's specific to spawning walleye. Walleye are uh, unable to naturally spawn here in Honeyway Lake. They're not native. So they bring walleye in from the lake, spawn them, and then release fry back into, back into the lake. It's a really popular game fish, so that's the reason behind that. Um, FLCC students, they participate in that entire process. So just a little bit on there. And before we get into the Big Ten, we thought it was really important to just create this awareness, um, this mindfulness of acknowledging the land and the water that surrounds the Honeyway Valley. Um, there are so many different species here. They all play super important roles in keeping the ecosystem balanced, healthy, it enriches the ecosystem, it enriches our lives. And we just feel, you know, it's our obligation as human beings to be respectful of this land, to be responsible when we interact with it, and just always keep that in the back of our mind. Um, this land needs to stay, you know, in healthy shape for future generations to enjoy, and that's important to all of us. Okay, so the Big Ten, we, love all of the mammals and animals here at Mueller Field Station, but we picked out 10 that are intriguing, elusive, a little mysterious, and we're gonna go through them. So we're gonna start with the Virginia opossum. And the Virginia opossum is part of the order Didelphimorphia, that's hard to say, and family Didelphidae. And they are the only marsupial that lives in North America. Um, there are a lot of other marsupials. Some of them include wombats, kangaroos, um, Tasmanian devils. Those are endemic to Australia and New Zealand. Here in North America, we have the common Virginia opossum. There are other species of possum. There are about 65 in total. And all of the other ones live in Central and South America. So, where can we find possums in North America? Um, they're pretty much everywhere. They adapt really well to all different types of climates and environments. You can find them in forested areas. You can find them in the cities, near swamps. Um, they, just, they just are great. They can live anywhere. So a little bit about their diet. They are opportunistic omnivores. They're not picky about what they eat. They scavenge for food. Um, they're pretty nomadic, so they'll kind of follow the food, like wherever there's food, they're going to be. Uh, they'll eat fruits and grains, plant material, rodents, amphibians, carrion, garbage. So they're really not picky when it comes to eating. What else do we have? So they are mostly nocturnal and they're excellent tree climbers. So we can talk a little bit about their physical characteristics. So they have a naked prehensile tail. And you can kind of see this in um, the picture all the way to the right, although it is cut off, but I feel like most of us are probably familiar with the tail. Uh, prehensile means grasping. So it's going to help this possum, you know, maneuver around trees and keep their balance. Um, they also have five digits on both their front feet and their back feet. Um, on their back feet or their hind feet, they have an opposable thumb. So it kind of looks like our thumb, right? And that means that they can just, you know, grip things better, helping them climb trees again, helping them pick up food, whatever they're doing. So that's interesting. And I thought that it was super interesting how these marsupials work. So female possums, they can give birth to up to three litters of babies a year. And there's 20 jelly bean sized babies that they'll give birth to. And they're known as joeys. And she can only support 13 of them. Um, once they're birthed, they move into the mom's pouch, which is in her belly. And they'll stay there for two to two and a half months. Mama will continuously nourish them with milk. And then eventually they're gonna make their way 
out of the pouch onto the back and you can see that here. And I should show you this picture. That's a close up <laughs> of the little babies in the pouch. Really weird and cool. So they'll make their, their way on the back. When they get too big, they'll fall off and she'll just keep going. Wherever they fall off, they'll stay and that will be their new home. So that's a little bit about the possum. There's so much more um, to learn about them. They have lots of interesting behaviors and I think um, my time's up for the possum, but <laughs> if you're interested, look them up. <laughs> All right, so if I were to guess, I would assume that out of all of the animals we're gonna talk about today, you're probably most familiar with white-tailed deer. So white-tailed deer are in the order Arteodactyla, and they are in the Cervidae family. So we may be familiar with some other members of the Cervidae family. They are hooved ruminant animals. So this also includes elk and moose. There, um, another ruminant that you will be familiar with is a cow, um, meaning that they have extra stomachs or they like to chew their cud, which I'll talk about more in just a second. Um, they are a popular game species, which is probably why most people are super familiar with them. If um, you have the proper licensing, then you are able to legally hunt and harvest uh, white-tailed deer in New York State as a way of managing their populations. They are a edge species. They occupy a lot of forest, swamp, meadow habitats. Um, when we talk about edge spe species, edge habitat is kind of where one type of habitat ends and another one begins. So this is most often where a forest edge might meet a agricultural field or a meadow or your backyard. And they really love this type of habitat, um, I would guess, due to their feeding strategy. So they are herbivores. They love to browse on woody plants and their diets might change seasonally depending on what's available and what is growing at the time. But they'll browse on buds, twigs, herbaceous vegetation, agricultural crops such as corn um, and other crops. They'll also eat acorns and different kinds of tree nuts. Um, and they usually will we'll see them feeding in fields around dusk and dawn. There's a really fun term for this. It's called crepuscular. If you're crepuscular, that means you're active around dusk and around dawn. And I just think that's a fun word. So they, um, around dusk and dawn, they will continue to consume really large amounts of vegetation. So they'll chew it up really quickly and then they'll retreat midday or at night, they'll retreat back to cover. And during the time that they're kind of like hiding out or maybe they're bedding down in their bedding sites, they will regurgitate little bits of the food that they like very hastily consumed earlier and continue to chew it and then swallow it and digest it uh, more thoroughly. And so this is a really interesting um, feeding strategy when you think about the possibility that this might actually reduce their exposure to predators during the day. So they go out and they feed and then they kind of retract and are able to continue digesting their food in a way that um, allows them to kind of hide a little bit for most of the day. Um, so their, their bedding areas are where they can find um, safety and rest throughout the day. They'll often use these and even the um, trails, if you've ever seen deer trails in the woods, they'll use these um, sometimes for years, the same kind of areas in their home range, as long as food resources are abundant. Um, also part of their behavior, um, you may find them when they feel threatened or um, feel like they are in danger, um, trying to alarm other members um, of the deer family by stomping their hooves, of snorting, or even flagging their um, the underside of their tail is nice and white, how they get their name, the white-tailed deer, which you can see in the picture up in the top left on the screen. Um, and that's like a form of communication, trying to warn the other deer that something might be threatening them. And what's really interesting, I think, is when they're stomping on the ground, they actually have scent glands um, interdigitally, so in between their hooves. And so they're actually laying down scent on the ground when they stomp, but also when they're bounding, when they're um, kind of, you see them like bounding through a field, every bound they make, they're also placing scent on the ground, which is kind of cool. Um, we know 
female from male deer because uh, male deer grow antlers. And so the difference between antlers and horns is that antlers are shed every year. They're shed annually. So this is the skull of a young white-tailed buck. And when, at the time that this happened to um, be harvested, I actually, I don't know where the skull came from. It's just at the field station, but I assume somebody probably hunted it, harvested it, whatever. Um, so this is a young, what we would call a spike buck. And what's interesting is when they shed them, the next year they'll grow them back and progressively they do get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it kind of peter out around like maybe age six, they'll stop um, kind of growing in size, but they'll get more tines on them. The base will get a little bit bigger. Um, so you can kind of tell the age of the deer maybe by the size of its antler, um, but actually a really foolproof way to um, estimate the age of the deer, this is a lot of what the DEC does, is by their teeth. Um, so you can tell by how worn they are um, and also what, what teeth are present, um, usually the bottom jaw, which I don't have for this, but um, you can really tell their age pretty accurately through their teeth, which I think is um, kind of a unique feature. Ah, the red fox, bulpies, bulpies. One of my favorite animals and the first carnivore of tonight. So these animals are an order carnivora um, and they're in family candidate, which means they're in the dog family. Red fox are actually the most uh, prolific land predator in the world. They have the widest distribution of any land predator in the world. They pretty much occur all over the uh, northern hemisphere from the arctic circle to north america europe even parts of north africa and asia they've also even been introduced to parts of australia uh, where they've become sort of an ecological problem uh, red fox very common in our area um, often confused with another species we have the gray fox but the key identifying features are really going to be those black socks and the white tip on the end of the tail. Red fox come in many different uh, color morphs. The red variation is really the typical morph, but it's totally common to see animals of a silver morph or even a cross morph where they kind of are crossed between a red and a uh, melanistic or black fox. Um, so, naming animals after colors, probably not the best thing, but again, if you're looking at a fox and you're not sure if it's a red or a gray, always look for the white tip on the tail and the black socks. These guys are carnivores, so they eat a good amount of meat. Um, I personally really like having them on my little hobby farm because they're a wonderful, uh, sustainable way for me to eliminate rodents from my area. Um, so they're definitely going to be eating a lot of small mammals, uh, birds, herps like snakes and frogs, and they also eat a, a good amount of vegetation like berries and apples as well. Foxes are actually one of those animals that tend to cache food. Um, so they will actually take leftover food or excess food and they'll dig a little hole in the ground. They'll put the food in it. They'll cover it back up. And they might even defecate or urinate on it so they can find it again later. Right now is actually the season of Amore. Uh, this is peak baiting season for red fox. Um, so at Mueller Field Station and on my own property, and I'm sure you guys are seeing this on your, in your, at your own places, this is the time of year where you start to see a lot of courtship behavior between males and females. Um, so we often see, you know, a uh, pair of fox running through the property and disappearing into, uh, you know, good denning site areas. Den sites for fox are pretty variable. Um, they will excavate their own dens, but they often will just enlarge the dens of other animals, for example, woodchuck, and actually will on occasion cohabitate a den with an animal like a woodchuck, which is very interesting. So hopefully if you guys are finding fox dens on your property, 
um, what I recommend is that you find a respectable distance to set a camera trap because by March and April, the kits will be born. And it's just a few short three to four weeks before they start venturing out the den um, to start following mom and dad around and learning the ropes. All right, raccoon. This is also in the order carnivora and it's in the family Procyonidae. Um, they are the most prolific mammal in New York state. And this is probably because they're not picky about their habitat and they're not really picky about their diet. Um, they will occupy anything, but, uh, you know, as far as forests, you can find them in wetlands. You can find them in urban areas, maybe your trash can, um, agricultural areas. They're just kind of everywhere. Um, they are also considered opportunistic omnivores. So what this means is that they just kind of take advantage of what's available, what's out there. Um, they will, they've got like really, um, Ellie earlier showed you the hands of a, um, of the possum, the raccoon, which you can, you can kind of see in the left-hand side of the screen. They have even more human-like little paws, little hands, really good at manipulating their food. Um, so it makes it really easy for them to quickly grab crayfish, frogs, any other sort of aquatic critters. They'll also forage for mice, maybe insects. They'll definitely raid nests. When I was working um, on some of the waterfowl nest surveys I've done as some of my field work, we would definitely find a lot of nests predated by raccoons and foxes and even avian predators, so our birds of prey. Um, but their hands make it really easy for them to kind of get into things and eat a very wide variety of food. They'll also forage on fruits, berries, plants, um, vegetables, again, crops from your farm and gardens, and um, and trash. That's how, you know, they've gotten the name recently, the Trash Panda. <laughs> um, they're also mostly nocturnal. Um, but they also um, are kind of considered crepuscular as well. They'll exhibit that kind of um, dusk and dawn activity. And they're pretty solitary, except for when they're breeding, which is through uh, December through February. They might, you, know, you might see them in pairs. Um, the female will have one litter per year. She'll have about three to seven offspring. And those offspring might stay with the female through the first winter. And surprisingly enough, the gestation period for a raccoon is only two months, which I found that remarkably short. Um, and during winter area, uh, during winter time in northern areas, raccoons uh, may sleep in their dens for a couple of days or even weeks at a time. Although they're not really considered like hibernators, you still definitely see them out and about in the winter time. Um, and they might have a fixed home range, which definitely varies. I think again because of their opportunistic nature of where they, um, they'll kind of occupy anywhere, but they're not really active defenders of their territory. So um, we kind of have considered them kind of like nomadic. They don't have a very strict home range of a very strict size that they very strictly defend. They're just kind of, again, super opportunistic and kind of nomadic little critters. I think they're adorable. They are. <laughs> All right, let's see what's up next. Okay, so up next is the Fisher. Oh gosh, I was gonna pronounce its scientific name with an Italian accent, but I don't. I don't remember. <laughs> Martes <Yeah>. Bonanti. <laughs> um, they're part of the order Carnivora, and the family Mus Mustelidae. I could never say that right, and that's the weasel family. So Fisher are found exclusively in North America. Um, historically speaking, their numbers experienced a really big decline, a severe decline in the early or in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, that's due to overexploitation. So a lot of their habitat was un there was unregulated logging there. Um, they were clearing land for agriculture, and the habitat was pretty much you know it went away, and these fisher weren't able to live here anymore. So since that happened, um, there has been reintroduction programs where they tried to restore the fisher and they have been successful in doing so. 
Um, they are forest dwellers, so they're going to be in deciduous, coniferous, and mixed forests. They, I'm going to talk about their diet in just a minute because we have an activity that goes with it. A little bit about their behavior. Um, they are terrestrial weasels. Uh, they are related to the, um, what is it, the ferret. I was just looking at them in Petco the other day. Um, so they're really cool. They climb trees. They're solitary. They're elusive. We really don't see them here at Mueller Field Station often. We do get them on trail camera every now and again. They do use a variety of structures um, for year-round denning. So they'll use natural cavities um, in older trees. They'll use hollow logs, things like that. To even um, the females will use hollowed out trees to have their babies high up in the trees in like those holes that you would see, those snag trees. So the diet's really interesting. Um, we have a Fisher stomach diet analysis research project going on here at Mueller Field Station. So FLCC college students and Dr. John Van Neel, who is the director of the field station and is in charge of this project, they go through hundreds of Fisher stomachs that are supplied by the DEC. And these, this is a list of all of the things they found in these Fisher stomachs. So Fisher stomachs are super opportunistic. Um, if you look at the sampling of mammals that they eat, that's a lot, they're, it's almost all of them. Uh, most commonly, they're gonna be finding short-tailed shrews in their stomachs, deer, mice, mouse, mices. Um, <laughs> they are porcupine specialists. So they're one of the only mammals that can eat a porcupine. And it's really brutal how they do it. They actually incapacitate them. They, they slash at their face. And once, once that porcupine is disoriented and like just beat up, they'll roll them onto their stomach and their stomach does not have any quills. So they'll just start eating, eating it that way, which is pretty gruesome, but pretty impressive at the same time. Um, super interesting. A lot of people report that Fisher eat turkeys and that's why there might be a decline in the turkey population, the wild turkey population. But what they found here at Mueller Field Station is there's only been three turkeys uncovered in hundreds of stomachs. So maybe people are being, you know, misled. Um, they're just not finding evidence of that. People are also blaming Fisher for eating cats. So whether that be their house cats or stray cats, but they have not found a cat in a Fisher stomach to date. Um, so just really interesting. Oh, another weird thing, Fisher, there has been other Fisher found in Fisher stomachs. So there is some evidence of cannibalism. They are pretty ruthless little, little <laughs> animals. So we have this fun activity. Um, the professor or Dr. John Van Neel, he takes these really cool pictures of contents under microscopes. So this is a really zoomed in microscope picture of a part of an animal. And we wanted you to guess what it is and put your guess into the chat. And let me know if anybody guesses correctly. And while so they're guessing, while they're guessing, Alyssa, Alyssa asked in the, I guess there's a Q and A box and a chat box. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> WebEx, you're weird. Um, <laughs> so Alyssa has asked, how were these food types determined? I'm sure some are obvious and Ellie's done a lot more of it. I did a little bit of it with a field trip with some kids and like, yeah, some of it is obvious, but like, yeah, does John or whoever have like a very specific way of finding out? Like, do they DNA test the, the like mystery particles? Like, what's the best way to really determine what they um, are? I think when they're, I think that they know it's a specific animal when they're looking at like the, the little claws or the little feet of certain animals. There is a lot of fleshy material and they don't, they can't really identify it based on that just flesh, that meat in the stomach. So they just categorize that as flesh. I think JVN just knows so much about these animals that he can identify. Um, oh, I was gonna give away the, the answer to this picture. <laughs> but like he can he can identify like a deer mouse like foot. You know what I mean? So yeah. that's a good question. I don't have a great answer for it. Sure. Did anybody get this correct or right? 
I'm not seeing anything in the chat, um, but maybe if you give them like a couple hints. Okay. So this is a uh, fossorial animal. It lives under the ground. It's pretty small. It has a really interesting shaped nose. This is a nose. Um, Aaron, if you want to give some clues too, I don't, I don't know how to, I don't want to give it away. Alyssa the has nose, guessed. I think has, I want to say between 20 and 30,000 uh, different sensory receptors on that nose, wow. like this, which is the picture to the left. If there are no guesses, there are. There are guests. Okay. Mmm. They got it. Nice. So this is a star-nosed, star-nosed mole, right? Am I saying that correct? Oh, mm -hmm. this is not a. Tur oh, somebody said turtle on the on the right. So these are actually from the same animal. I should have said that in the beginning. This is from the same animal. Both of these parts. I thought that earlier when you showed me this picture, if I didn't see the nose, I would have <laughs> thought that little foot was a cute little turtle paw. But it's a not. Little, yeah, and it has the hair on it too, right? Oh, yeah, I do see that. A hairy turtle paw. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up. What do we think? I can give you some clues. Um, this is an aquatic, semi-aquatic mammal. I'm noticing um, this object on the bottom here. That's actually a foot. And that yeah. foot has four toes on it. Yeah. Four toes. The other parts are from a tail. It's a smaller semi-aquatic mammal. I bet Alyssa's got this. She <laughs> says she's not answering. Ah. She's, oh, okay. She's got this. <laughs> Judy guessed correctly. Nice. It's a muscle. Good job. Yeah. Good job, Judy. Nice. All right. One more. This one's tricky. This one had me stumped at first. <laughs> Took me a, a, a clue to get this one. Yes. So this is part of an animal we've already talked about tonight. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> they are ears. So we're looking at these white and black. <laughs> fleshy little things. Also, not a lot of hair on those ears. No. Little naked ears. <laughs> They're cute. <laughs> <laughs> Any guesses? Yeah. She's got it. Nice. These are awesome ears. Pretty crazy what you'll find in a fish or stomach, right? All right, let's keep going. Ah, the American beaver, Castor canadensis. This is one of our favorite animals here at Mueller Field Station. Um, this is the first rodent up tonight, and I think the only rodent up tonight. Um, they're actually in the family Castoridae, and they are actually the largest rodent in North America, second largest in the world, second to the capybara. As uh, so. I've had the opportunity to study a lot of these animals in the field, which is great, um, but I also have a wonderful opportunity to work with about half of these species in captivity as well. And so I just wanted to share some uh, zookeeper insights on these animals. Beaver and capybara, nothing alike. They look pretty similar. They're both semi-aquatic um, and they're both, you know, really large bodied rodents. Um, but 
uh, uh, American beaver in a zoological situation, they're fastidiously clean. They're a zookeeper's dream. Um, the only thing is that you constantly have to be supplying them with building material because even, um, you know, even in captivity, when their meals are delivered at a specific time every day, they have such a strong drive to be industrious. That is not true for the capybara. Capybara are very uh, social, mellow, awesome animals that they, they do great in mixed species exhibits, um, but they are disgusting animals. <laughs> and, um, they're one of the least favorite animals to clean up after for a zookeeper. And just a, like a fun little side note, the the nickname for a capybara in a zookeeper's world is a crappy bear. The beaver, on the other hand, like I said, they're highly industrious animals. Um, and again, they are heavily semi-aquatic. They spend a lot of their time in the water and they're well adapted to do that. So American beaver, they have valvular ears and nostrils to help keep water out when they're under the water. They have a second uh, eyelid called a nictitating membrane that sort of functions like underwater goggles. Their lips actually can close behind their teeth so that they can chew uh, sticks underwater and carry building materials, which is awesome. And that tail doesn't make, I mean, it, it makes a great rudder in the water, but it's actually uh, a great tool for thermal regulation. It really consists of aggregate hairs, like compressed hairs, but it's highly vascularized. Um, so they can absolutely use it to uh, either um, cool their body temperature by sending more blood flow through that in the summertime, or they can actually restrict blood, throw, uh, blood flow through the, the tail um, and retain body heat in the winter is amazing. These guys are strict herbivores. They are definitely taking a lot of vegetation from the side of, ch of the channel at Mueller Field Station. Um, a lot of different tree species. They have a preference for things like cottonwood um, and other poplars. And the speckled alder that is uh, very dominant along the channel. Um, but one of our favorite things about the beaver is the fact that they are known as an ecosystem engineer. And some of you guys probably have heard this term before. Um, beaver are, are actually known as an allogenic ecosystem engineer, which means that they create, uh, maintain, or modify habitat through mechanical means. And those mechanical means are construction of the dam and the dam that subsequently creates a beaver impoundment. The whole reasoning behind that for a beaver is they um, they really want to maintain a water level that's high enough to not freeze all the way through the winter um, so that they can still access, you know, their their cache of food under the water, um, even when the channel is frozen over. So they're a wonderful animal. They, they definitely are helping to maintain the channel at Mueller Field Station and just make it a really rich ecosystem that helps support a lot of other different kinds of animals like waterfowl and different, uh, you know, uh, amphibians and reptiles and other mammals as well. We love the beaver here. We do. It's our mascot. Yes. So next up we have the bobcat and they are part of order carnivora and family Felidae. And bobcat are twice, roughly twice the size of the average house cat. They can weigh from 11 to 30 pounds. They are identified by their black spots on their body. They have this bobbed tail hence their name. So it is black and white. Um, they have ear tufts and they also have this rough of facial hair. So for centuries, um, they were considered a harmful predator and they were hunted abundantly. They, they had beautiful fur coats. Some people considered them nuisances and scary. Um, so there were bounties on, on bobcats for a long time. In 1971, um, there were some management practices put into place that really 
looked at the populations of bobcats and made sure that they were stabilized, that they were being harvested uh, sustainably. Now we welcome them here for the most part. They're really elusive. They're pretty much to themselves and they're not interfering with humans like people used to think they were. Um, their range is from coast to coast. They're really all over the United States. You can find them in the extreme south. You can find them in Canada. Um, you can even find them in Mexico. They are, their habitat, preferred habitats are forests, bogs, swamps. So we do have bobcat down here at Miller Field Station. I think it's interesting to note that the first picture we got of a bobcat on one of our trail cameras was back in 2017. Um, which isn't too long ago. So we had trail cameras out for years and years and years. And then one day one popped up on the camera. We were really excited. And we think that that's because of the improved habitat in the southern Honeyway Valley. Um, most of the land surrounding the lake is protected by different environmental um, organizations. So the Nature Conservancy, the Finger Lakes Land Trust, the Department of Environmental Conservation, FLCC. Um, so this land is protected and it's just a safe haven for animals. So the bobcat returning to this area is really very cool. We get them on camera frequently now. So we do believe there is a population here. Uh, they are strict carnivores. So they're gonna eat you know, small rodents, rabbits. Um, they'll eat smaller deer. They'll eat some grouse, turkey, reptiles, amphibians. They're really sticking to the meat category. Um, they are really solitary animals, very territorial, and they are stealthy hunters. Um, I was going to include a video of a bobcat jumping across a pretty wide river. It's incredible how far these cats can jump. I'm impressed by my cat at home, and then I watch this cat, and I'm just like, wow. They're like sprays, it's, it's wild. Um, so critical, you know, environmental features for bobcats, um, they really need to take refuge in protected areas. So rocky outcrops, um, different ledges, hollow trees, brush piles, things like that. That's where they're gonna stay and sleep. Um, and I also recently learned, you know, they're great climbers and I'm always out walking the channel trail and I'm like, I really want to see a bobcat. Like I'm just waiting for the day. And I never look up in the trees and apparently like they'll hang out in trees. So now I know to scan up above me as well. Um, another interesting fact, they can live up to 12 years in the wild and in captivity, they can live up to 32 years. And that's such a significant difference. Um, I just thought that was really fascinating. So really, really beautiful and really happy that they're here. Um, here's just a, a slide comparing the lynx and the bobcat. So lynx, um, you're going to find them more north. Sometimes they make their way into the Adirondacks, so really, really northern part of New York, but you're, they're really in Canada for the most part. And there are some differences that you can see straight up here. So they have much larger paws. They have an even smaller tail. They have longer ear tufts. They have longer legs. So, and a different coloration. So, yeah. The river otter, Lantra canadensis. This is the second weasel uh, species up tonight. Um, but unlike the fisher, which is more of a terrestrial animal, uh, river otter are highly semi-aquatic. Um, so a lot of you guys probably know that river otter were nearly extirpated from the state by 1900s. So that means that they were pushed out. Uh, they no longer occurred here naturally due mostly to exploitation, um, over hunting, over trapping destruction of habitat, and so on. But maybe not so many of you know that there was actually a reintroduction program um, by the DEC between 1995 and 2000. And the Mueller Field Station was actually one of the sites where river otter were released. 
Now, fast forward 20 years, river otters still are residing at Mueller Field Station. We often don't see them with our own two eyes. They're highly elusive animals. And generally, when the three of us are out on the channel, we're accompanied by 10 to 20 rambunctious K-12 students. Um, so we are not often seeing them out there, but we are able to monitor them through non-invasive means by looking for uh, latrine sites, which is a place where the river otter are going to repeatedly defecate um, as a mode of communication with members of their own species. Um, so we are constantly seeing these latrine sites. They're still very active, and we're always capturing image of the images of them on our camera traps. Um, so they're just really amazing animals. And Mueller Field Station is a great habitat for them. We have ample supply of clean, fresh water, lots of different species of delicious fish and crayfish and frogs for them to eat. It's fairly secluded there. Um, and there's plenty of wonderful denning sites for otter there. They do have a tendency to choose bank dens, um, but they have a really close relationship with uh, American beaver. So we have actually um, noted uh, that river otter at Mueller Field Station have taken over old um, beaver lodges and used them as den sites. And they're still using them as latrines today, which is amazing. All these guys are just absolutely wonderful um, and, and powerful swimmers in the water, um, but on land, not so much. And I don't think we really have time to show you guys the, the video of them sliding through the snow, um, but I would highly recommend after the presentation tonight, hop on YouTube and just search uh, river otter sledding because it's, it's just going to make your day. All right, the American black bear, um, also another member of uh, the order Carnivora. Um, the American black bear, Ursus americanus, is part of the Ursidae family, um, as is the grizzly bear. Um, so life history, the population has uh, made quite a comeback. We have somewhere between six to 8,000 bears in New York state. Where are all these bears? <laughs> That's a lot of bears. Um, they're, Preferred habitat is forests, kind of mountainous areas, swampy areas, um, and they are also an omnivore. So I think that they kind of get like this um, bad rap of being like super aggressive, like carnivorous animals, but they'll also just forage on roots and berries. Um, they will eat carrion, which is already dead animals. Um, they'll forage on grasses, grubs. They might attack an ant colony um bees honey um and contrary to what some people might think they're actually not really like huge fish eaters they probably will eat fish but they're not really as good at like catching fish like you'll see like a grizzly bear like snatching a fish out of a stream black bears don't really do that um let's see um they enter a state of from like a like true hibernation um it is where they have a reduced metabolic rate and reduce their body temperature this helps them kind of conserve energy and helps them survive during periods of low food availability so they will the sow will go in her den um and she will she'll also wake up to give birth and care for her cubs that'll be in there with her and they might stay in there for maybe a couple months um, and torpor may also be longer and deeper in the north and then shorter or maybe even non-existent in the south where there is more food available. So this might be why they're not quite considered like true hibernators. Um, someone that is a true hibernator is a woodchuck. So a woodchuck will go underground, be in a deep, deep, deep sleep, um, not really able to be uh, like roused and woken up. Um, whereas the the bear is just kind of in this super lazy, lethargic state and will just kind of like stay that way for a while to conserve energy and and all of that. 
Um, there are a couple different color phases of the black bear. So contrary to its name, they're not always um, showing um, that black fur color phase. You can see them in more of a brownish color, a blonde color, even a cinnamon color. Um, I was in Canada once and I saw some black bears on the side of the road and the female mom bear was a cinnamon and she had three cubs with her and um, one of them was a cinnamon color and the other two were the black color phase. So it's just like, it's just a color expression, um, just like any of us having different colored hair. Um, something interesting that they do behavior wise is they will use and create these really well-defined paths and you'll find often some scat tracks, um, but also these like mark trees. And so these mark trees are created when a bear kind of reaches up and scratches the tree. They might even bite the tree. Um, they'll also kind of like rub their back, maybe leaving behind some hair and some scent. Um, and this is possibly a form of communication. We don't really know why they do this. Um, so there's ongoing research about um, about the behavior of bears and kind of why they will like pretty prominently make marks on trees. Um, and so, yeah, that's our best guess is that it's probably some sort of communication um, for other bears. All right, the Eastern Coyote. Uh, truthfully, I am heavily biased towards this animal. I have worked with about five coyotes in zoological situations and I just absolutely adore these animals. They're just wonderful creatures. These are our second canid up tonight. So they are related to animals like fox, wolves, domestic dogs. Um, interestingly enough, coyotes are not native to New York State. Historically, they're endemic to the West Coast, so, or Western US. So really, um, they really shouldn't be here. Um, but they have been established in New York State since about the 1940s. And the reasoning behind this is much like a lot of these animals we've mentioned tonight, a lot of our native populations took serious hits and uh, in serious decline in uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, so as our native apex predators, like wolves and mountain lions are being eliminated in vast numbers very rapidly, that opens up opportunity for smaller meso predators like coyotes to move in and take over the role of apex predator in the region, which is essentially what these coyotes do now. They are apex predator. They are carnivores, so they eat a lot of different kinds of meat. Um, the diet assessment at ESF showed they have a preference for things like beaver, woodchuck, uh, turkey, smaller to medium sized animals. Though they do scavenge uh, a great deal of um, deer meat and will take fawns during fawning season. They also eat a good amount of vegetation and I have observed coyotes in captivity leaping eight feet straight up into the air to snatch apples out of the tree or very gingerly plucking uh, blackberries off of bushes. They're just incredible. Um, often I want to talk to people in, in this area. A lot of us have never actually seen a coyote with our own two eyes, but we're constantly hearing that. And I always hear people say, well, I, I heard a huge pack of coyotes behind my house last night. There must have been 30 individuals back there. Um, but that's not really how coyotes work. Um, they are very elusive, very cautious animals, and very pack oriented. And coyote packs really consist of a nuclear family. It's mom, dad, and siblings of various ages. Um, so generally speaking, you really have a maximum of like four, six coyotes in a pack in general. Um, it's really their strategy to give off as many barks and yips and, and howls as they can to create the illusion of a large pack um, that rival coyote packs don't wanna mess with. Um, so really no reason to be concerned by the sound of coyotes howling in their backyard. 
Um, they're really just great animals and they have a lot of ecological value. So we don't have too much time, but we're gonna go through some wildlife do's and don'ts and Chelsea's gonna start us off with that. So go for it. Yeah, so here's just like a couple of like the do's and don'ts um, for responsible wildlife watching. Um, obviously we want people to be excited about wildlife. We want people to appreciate wildlife. So please learn through observation. When you're outside, look for um, all sorts of wildlife sign. Look for uh, prints, look for poop, look for <laughs> marks on trees, um, look for nests, look for, and we're not, yeah, so this was about mammals, but please like observe um, amphibians, reptiles, birds, observe it all. Like there's so much to, to learn from outside. Um, so learn through observation, look for animal sign, um, provide wildlife friendly landscaping. This will not only increase um, the amount of wildlife that's like in and around your backyard or your land, but also um, increase birds and pollinators. And it just, it benefits everybody. Um, learning the names of different species by using field guides. Sometimes I'm really surprised at how many times I've just kind of out of um, like boredom or whatever, I've like flipped through a field guide and just looked at species that I've never seen before, whether it's plants or birds. And then who knows how much time will pass and then I'll see something outside and I'll be like, oh, and somehow I just know what they are because I like saw it one time in a field guide. And so it just really increases your awareness of things when you are outside observing stuff. Keeping a nature journal, that's really fun. It's also a really cool way to document the changes from season to season and then from year to year. Um, whether it's like the first time you saw some songbirds in the spring or um, the, you know, what type of prints you might be noticing around your house, maybe in some mud. So that's a really great way to document some of your um, observations. Um, also, please keep domestic cats and other pets away from bird feeders, nests, dens. I know a lot of people let their cats outside. I'm not here to tell you what to do with your pets, but bird or cats are one of the um, major threats to um, small mammals and songbirds, unfortunately. Um, please also secure garbage in wildlife proof containers um, or in a locked shed or weighted animal proof covers. Um, this just really helps reduce wildlife human conflict, which um, can be not only dangerous to us as humans, but also um, to the animal. And so Aaron will talk a little bit more about that in a second as well. Um, and another super great passive, non-invasive way, um, which we do a ton of here, is to use trail cameras on your property and see what animals are there. You might be surprised. And it's just um, really, really awesome to catch maybe some behavior of some of our cool mammals that we have in New York State. Um, but also, you might not know that you have a fisher or a bobcat in your backyard. And that's really, really, really cool. Nothing to be afraid of. So here's some examples of the animal sign that you can observe while you're out and about. Um, we recently put on the schedule, we have Wednesday morning walks down here at Mueller Field Station. So if you're available on a Wednesday morning at 9 a.m., uh, come down here, it's open to anybody. And we'll walk along the channel, we'll go, we'll go in all different directions and we'll see what we can find. It's an educational walk. Um, it's also just an enjoyable walk where we hope to bring community members together. Um, if you want to bring a little, a little one with you, anybody. So right now the trails are definitely packed with snow, which we learned this morning was a little bit, you know, difficult, but we envision, you know, we know that the snow will eventually melt and really feel free to bring like some ski poles with you to help get through the snow. It's really very nice. So we welcome you to come. You can see, um, you know, on our Facebook page, it's advertised and yeah. Yeah, so special shout out to Judy, Frank and Jane that came out and <laughs> trudged through the snow with us in like 13 degree, degree weather this morning. It was <laughs> quite lovely. And I'm not joking, it was very lovely. It I, was. I thoroughly enjoyed it, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
some don'ts. Um, please don't assume if you find a baby rabbit or a fawn that they've been abandoned. Oftentimes a um, parent animal will leave their babies to rest somewhere while they go and forage and feed and they'll come back for it. So um, don't panic if you find a, 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 a the young of the year animal just kind of hanging out. Um, their mom will probably hopefully come back for it. Um, and other than bird feeders, we don't want to also supply wildlife with a artificial food source that creates um, numerous issues um, and safety issues for not only yourself, but the animal. And it's also just not good for their digestive systems and their diets and, and all of that. So um, they can find their own food. Um, don't hand it, handle an animal that looks sick or injured. And please don't harass, chase, illegally harm wildlife, even if to you, you think it's a nuisance. So, even if you do all those wonderful do's and don'ts that Chelsea laid out for you, conflicts can still happen. Um, so, there's a wonderful acronym put out by the New York State Dep uh, Department of Environmental Conservation, the DEC, called REPEL. And that is to remove, eliminate, put up barriers, excite, and legally remove. So just to reiterate some of what Chelsea has already said, you know, keep that, uh, you know, your, your food sources under control um, and out of the, uh, the, you know, greedy paws of a black bear or something to that effect. So yeah, feed your animals indoors, don't leave pet food, bird seed outside, um, and, you know, put a fence around your garden. Um, you can also eliminate cover um, and shelter that an animal might uh, take advantage of around your home. Um, so you can get rid of a lot of those uh, brush piles and uh, stacks of firewood around your home. Not only do they potentially offer uh, housing for a lot of the animals we mentioned, but moving them away from your home is going to reduce, um, you know, inv inviting small mammals like rodents and mice into your home as well. Also, you can mow a lot of the tall grass in your area, um, but they it's recommended that when you do a lot of this mowing um, around your buildings to wait until the fall after a lot of your nesting tur uh, turtles and birds are inactive. Putting up barriers doesn't just mean um, eliminating all those places on your home where animals could enter and take up residence. It also can mean just protecting your livestock and your gardens as well. Um, so as a zookeeper, when we design zoo enclosures, we design them not only to keep animals in, but also to keep other animals out. Um, so you can think of your chicken coops and things like that the same way. How can you construct them in a way to keep predators like fox and mink and other things like that out. Um, and so a lot of people, when they have these issues with animals coming after their chickens, you hear that their their first option often is to eliminate that animal, um, which is really only a temporary solution, right? Because more animals are gonna move into the area. But if you secure your, your chicken coops and uh, your barns in a way that they're not gonna be able to get in and out, that is ideal. That's a long-term solution to protect your animals. So you can do things like include dig guards. Chickens are big diggers as well. So put some fencing in at the bottom of your coop and then cover it with stone and stone dust. That's gonna keep not only your chickens from digging, um, but it's gonna keep other animals from digging in as well. Additionally, you like you can include things like jump guards and stuff like that. Um, if you have ducks around a pond, you can put electrical fencing around the pond and turn it on at night to keep animals out of there. There are so many creative things that you can do to deter animals from your houses, from your barns, and from your, your domestic animal enclosures. Additionally, another thing that just popped up, if you have problems with beaver, you may see uh, people putting fencing around uh, uh, trees to uh, keep beaver from chewing on them. Um, it's important to note that you need to select a wire 
that is a large enough gauge that they're not going to chew through it. Um, so in the zoo world, we recommend 11 and a half gauge or higher. Excite or agitate. So this is what you're going to want to do if you have like a coyote or a blackbird in your yard and they're maybe not respecting your personal space as much as you would like them to. Um, so it's recommended that you should try to um, keep, a you know, help instill a healthy fear and respect for human beings and animals. A lot of us really want to pretend we're Snow White and go out there and make friends with animals, but that's not doing them any favors. Um, so really, ex uh, Excite stands for basically hazing the animal. You're going to make loud noises, you're going to uh, present yourself as intimidating, and you're going to try to scare them out of your territory. Legally remove or take. The last part of repel. This is where it gets tricky. Um, as somebody who has worked in zoos and wildlife centers, every year I get phone calls of people who say, I have trapped a woodchuck in my garden. He's in the trap. What do I do now? I think I'm going to take him to this park and drop him off. Well, there are legalities around anything you do with animals. Um, so I would ask Allie to open this bottom link. The DEC has a web uh, on their website. They have um, the ability for you to. Oh, sorry. Maybe I'll wait for her to open this link here. Here we go. So this is really everything you need to know. Um, if you don't mind scrolling up and down it. If you have a problem with any of these animals on this list, it will tell you whether or not you need to contact the DEC in regards to taking this animal, which means either you're relocating or harvesting. Poor so, chipmunks. Pardon? I said poor chipmunks. Yeah, poor chipmunks for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, the rule of thumb, like don't do anything with wildlife without uh, understanding the legalities behind it. Um, so thank you for that, Allie. They have links in on that web page that will take you straight to the applications. If you are a person who wants to apply to take rid, uh, to take care of a nuisance animal on your property, um, but better yet, the DC also has a special license search engine, so you can actually search for a uh, uh, control <laughs> uh, nuisance wildlife officer. Additionally, I get calls every year. Oh, you're skipping ahead on me, Ellie. You go back. Thank you. Um, I just get, leave it right there. <laughs> I get calls every year from people uh, who, well, I'm just going to say it bluntly, well-meaning people who have essentially kidnapped a baby animal and then don't know what to do with it. Um, so again, like if you're one of these people who finds a, a baby animal out by itself, you should not be handling this animal. You should take a GPS waypoint on your cell phone and maybe come back in a few hours to check to see if it's still there. If it is, then it's time to contact a wildlife rehab for before you even handle this animal at all. Um, and again, the DC has a great special licensing search engine that you can go on their website and you can search for licensed wildlife rehabilitators. They also have um, a uh, DEC Con Officer Wildlife Dispatch Line, or you can contact the DEC office um, in your region um, to talk to wildlife officers on staff for any additional questions. And the last point I want to make today is to mitigate a lot of these conflicts with animals, it's really up to us to be good neighbors. One of the first concepts that the three of us learned while we were conservation students in CON 100, Intro to Conservation, is the concept of cultural carrying capacity. And so ecological carrying capacity is a different thing. That's how many animals per given area. Cultural carrying capacity is how many of a particular species 
humans are comfortable with having in their area. And so part of the reasons we put this uh, PowerPoint together for you tonight was to try to increase our cultural carrying capacity for a lot of these animals, including uh, carnivores, because they all have ecological value and intrinsic value. Well said. <laughs> so we're coming to the end of the PowerPoint. Um, if you are interested in learning more about environmental topics, we do have a pretty great YouTube channel. It has all of our past speaking of natures, so you can check that out. We do have some virtual field trips where you can learn more about the semi-aquatic mammals that live here, um, more about using trail cameras to assess bio biological diversity. So there's a lot of different topics to explore. Um, we encourage you to check it out and subscribe to our channel. Put a link for that in the chat for you guys. Sweet, thank you. So we just have some pictures that we were gonna go through. Um, part of our K through 12 virtual programming this is more, we adapted this from a K through five presentation. So an activity that we do with the kids is we go through our big 10 and then they get to guess um, what animals they see in these trail camera pictures that we've gotten from Weaver Field Station. So we're just gonna go through them quickly. If you have a kid at home, maybe they can guess really quick. Um, so let's go through them. We're not going to really spend too much time because if there are questions, we'd love to, you know, answer them for you. So some river otter. This one's great. This is my favorite. <laughs> Three little river otter here. Deer. Fisher cat. We don't know what's in this uh, fox's mouth, but it looks, Chelsea and I think it's like a mole or something, but it does look big, so we don't know. Mm -hmm. Some sort of tasty snack. Yeah. <laughs> this is Tender a mouse. recent picture of a black bear down at Mueller. Bobcat using our track pit as a litter box. Very nice. <laughs> This is one of the first pictures we've got um, at, of a bobcat. So in the winter time with that fluffier coat. Here we have some beaver behavior being shown on camera. So there, this beaver here is creating what's called a scent mound. So it's cool with trail cameras, you not only get to see these animals, um, but you can see some of their behavior as well. And then just a cute little deer with its mama. So I know, you know, we went over time. It happens. But if you have questions, if you're still here, um, feel free to enter them into the Q&A or the chat. And we can do our best to answer them for you. And thank you for being here. If you have to go, thanks so much for tuning in tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. <laughs> We hope you learned something. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's our job. <laughs> cool. Oh, oh, that was Alyssa before. Thank you all. Can't wait to get back to the field station. Oh, that's, I feel like I know who that is. Is there anybody here still? Um, what about oh, there's some lions? Ah. What about porcupines? Porcupines at the field station. I have never seen one at the field station. I don't know if we've gotten one on a camera trap at the field station. Um, no, we haven't. Not that I know of. Hmm. But they are just wonderful animals. And if I could have included them on the Big Ten, I, I could have spent an hour talking about them alone. Yeah, I'm sure they're around. I don't know. I feel like we've. I feel like well, we've gotten them. Do you know? Porcupine habitat, I know that we were talking about how, you know, they like hemlock trees and stuff. So, like, I don't know if they're up up in the forest more, like up in the upland part, parts and maybe not down here in the swamp. I'm not sure. 
just might not be the right that's habitat true. for them. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually that's a good point. I think a lot of times people don't see them too because they're up in the canopy. Yeah. Right. Will you do another back count or a channel paddle? Asked David. Yeah, for sure. As soon as the weather starts warming up, we'll have spring channel paddles. Um, we'll definitely do another back count or a few of them. Um, definitely looking forward to that. Yeah. So just, you know, look on our Facebook. We'll always have um, an event posted for those things. And sometimes, you know, there's a registration process, but sometimes it's just open to whoever, whoever wants to join. And I, I can never give a, uh, you know, pass up an opportunity for shameless self promotion. So if you have watched the uh, speaking of nature on bats, Check it out on the YouTube channel. It's a really great presentation uh, by an awesome coworker. Yes, for sure. Awesome. All right. Well, I don't know. I don't, if nobody else has any questions, um, we love coming to the station and learning from all of you. Thanks. You're very welcome. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, David. <laughs> Okay. Well, everybody have a good night. Um, thank you. Please come and visit us. We will have, like I said, a couple of times, a lot of events on the schedule for the spring and the summer. So we look forward to that and stay warm. It's so cold out. <laughs> Take care. Have a good night. Thanks everyone. The best part is you don't even have to drive home. You're just already home. Yeah. That's so <laughs> nice. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Take care, everyone. Happy Wildlife Watching.